Hello and welcome to yet another episode of the Forever Forward podcast. In the world of facilities management, uh, we're seeing a marked shift towards data-led operations and maintenance, uh, which is spurred by increasing needs and expectations of built environment stakeholders um, in terms of efficiency, cost, sustainability, and occupant experience. Uh, what are your thoughts about this shift? I mean, as, as you mentioned, I mean, I think we wrote a LinkedIn article on this as well, uh, I think some time back, but overall, when you look at data led operations and maintenance, and again, there could be different ways how people would want to call it. You know, the more conventional professionals who are in reliability maintenance might call it condition-based maintenance, uh, predictive, and some might call it as business-focused maintenance. But ultimately, uh, the, the, the fact is that there is a movement happening from the way you currently run your scheduled maintenance, plan maintenance, plus reactive to us to something that's more guided by use of data, and that's that's happening slow, but but happening in, in that sense. Especially the, the pace of that happening in some sectors is far more than the others. So, for example, when you look at healthcare, when you look at data centers, where reliability is of of great concern, plus the fact that there's a dollar value attached to reliability is significantly higher. Uh, is happening much faster than versus what you would look at a commercial real estate. But even that's changing now. Yeah. So uh, for the benefit of our listeners, can you explain what exactly is meant by data-led operations and maintenance? And um, how would you distinguish between a process that is data-led and one that's not? Now, again, I much would want to call out that I'm no reliability expert. I'm no maintenance expert. I mean, as Zempla, uh, our endeavor, and, and particularly me as an individual who's been involved, is an endeavor has been seeing people who run operations and maintenance and help them with tools that can help them make better decisions. Now, based on whatever little I've seen, Siddharth, uh, by, by interacting, I mean, seen by working with customers, heard by interacting with prospects, so on and so forth, is that conventionally maintenance in across the built environment, if you say, has been done in a manner where you have a schedule lined up, you have a, a, a plan lined up according to which you run maintenance. So, for example, let's say you have an air handling unit, you're going to say, I'm going to run every one month, three months, six months, and 12 months. And it may happen that the steps that the technicians or engineers take on each of the respective frequency is going to be slightly different than the other. And plus, there is a reactive component which says, okay, if something happens, breaks down, if there is a complaint or whatever, then we'll go and, and, and attend to the assets. That's how contracts are budgeted for. That's how everything is set up. So that's, and, and, and inherently the way it's set up, you don't need a data, right? Like if I were to tell you that Siddharth, every one month you have to go and visit the doctor, uh, right? Without, whether you have some an issue or not, then you would just land up at the doctor's clinic, uh, whether you have an issue or not. Now, data led is something they're saying that, okay, where you're starting to see some, you're, you're starting to give data slightly more importance, insights slightly more importance, uh, along with the other strategies that you've been employing, which would mean that you're starting to factor in how is the asset running operationally, so on and so forth. Are there any symptoms being shown? And that would lead to the, the requisite strategy. So as the name suggests, a data led operations and maintenance is at least starting to say, okay, we will start to give data a slightly more weightage uh, versus what we've been doing so far in that sense. So that's how I would probably say, and, and data it could be, uh, as I mentioned earlier, could be could could be a function of part of, or as a whole, could be called as a condition-based maintenance, could be predictive maintenance, could be business-focused maintenance. There are a lot of different terms that are there, but invariably, if you move from the current method to any other method, data is important and you can't do without data. So that's how I would simply put it at, 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 as data led operations and maintenance. Interesting that you drew the comparison with uh, uh, with health, with yes. visiting, like how we function as people and how assets function and how they also need uh, timely repairs and upkeep. So that's that. I, mean, it, 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 I agree, man. I mean, it allows. Uh, I've always looked at with that as simplicity, and 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 most people will be very surprised that there's actually a lot of similarities between the way asset operates and the way human body operates. And and think of human body is also as an asset with multiple sub assets, right? But we won't go into length and depth on all of that uh, today on this this episode. So speaking of uh, being data led, uh, is the existing FM technology stack capable of running this data-led OM process that you just described. 
do you think uh, it has what it takes i think we might want to before i answer your, your question for the benefits of the, the the listeners we might want to take a step back and say why is the stack not like why are we even talking about technology stack like people have been stuck with cafe mc ms for so long uh, has worked for them and and why all of a sudden we are saying that whatever you have is not going to be enough and then the question comes in how are you going to get to the end state now the fact that we, we were not looking for data to make decisions we did not need it so if a system was incapable of providing us data it didn't matter right it did not really matter because we were not really looking for but now you're all of a sudden going to say okay uh we have our cost pressures our bottom line is is, is not being you know is not where it used to be uh this expectation from the customers all of that is wanting saying that okay let's move to data led uh process let's find a, a slightly more modified agile process to run operations and maintenance which puts reliability efficiency comfort right in the top of the agenda now, as soon as you do that, you say that my team is going to need data. You've got to supply with them with that. You've got to supply them. Now, then the, you've not just got to supply them with data. You've got to supply them with context, with insight, so that the decision making is, is inherently made easier and not difficult, right? And when you do that, you go back to your system and say, oh, wow, I mean, my software cannot correctly deliver that, right? And if you look at the classification of, of the software category, you have conventionally a system of record, system of engagement, and system of decisions. Uh, in our world, I would uh, sort of uh, keep it as system of records and system of decisions. System of records is, as the name suggests, where you have all the records kept. So a CMS does a great job, or CAFM does a great job. You have your asset inventory, you have asset details, your when was it bought, so on and so forth, How what's the frequency of maintenance, all of that is available. But you do not generally would have operational data and a lot of other context, which is which is otherwise carried through from the conversations and the and the tasks people carry out uh, all along. And that is where you need another system which can comprehend, talk to multiple systems, multiple data sources, and very specifically provide it provide the uh, decision support or saying insight that someone is looking for in in that sense. So, like a very simple yeah. example, if today. Uh, I were to go and do a maintenance activity, and I simply want to find out, okay, what the like, what's the asset performance like? Can I can I get a snapshot? Now the snapshot doesn't only mean when was the asset last maintained, but I want to check, okay, what are the typically the issues that have happened over the last uh, twelve months or, or last six months? Is there any other uh, work order that's pending over here, so on and so forth? You need a lot of those points coming to you as in terms of the story, so that you can then make better decisions in case if you're empowered to make one. And that is where we think that the stack is not capable of doing it. Um, and then that's where the question comes in. Uh, plus, there is the, the, there is an element of data quality, which we might just talk at length in a different episode. The CMMS is the way they are built. They can just, they're checklists. Like people can simply take, take, take. I've done this, I've not done this. But why have you done what have you done? What led you to make those decisions? Those are very important to be captured. If at all, at some point in time, we need to make use of, of technologies like generative AI or AI in general. So long story short, the technology stack worked for so long because you, people were not looking for data or insights. And now that people have started to look for data and insights, the technology stack falls short. So now that people are looking for more data and insights and context to their how their assets are performing, so which leads me to the question, uh, what does the ideal tech stack then look like for FMs uh, looking to run data-led operations and maintenance? So I think I'll answer this in context of two different FM segments. One is uh, tier one service providers, you know, who have already invested over a period of time on tools like Maximo, FSI, of the world, or Actons, or whatever you've been using. The good thing is you don't have to stop using them. It's not easy to shift, but the good thing is you don't have to uh, uh, to, to, to change, but you can add series of applications or different platforms which can talk to that and then get to the end outcome. Uh, and I think that's probably the fastest, most cost effective way to do that. Uh, the idea would be to have an integrated end to end platform, but that's capital expenditure. I mean, you're talking about moving from one huge software that you've been using for so long to a, a new one. It's not just the cost of replacement from the point of view of paying to the software vendor, but it's also the change management in ETC that comes through. So you don't want to do that. So coming back to the tier one players, your system of record works fine, but cover all the gaps by bringing in applications that can interact with your with your system of record, uh, right? Or you know, you may decide which becomes more 
powerful in the times to come, which means is your SOR more powerful or uh, or center of the stack? But at least it serves as a central repository. But for the tier two FM companies, which are emerging FM companies, I think they should start looking at platforms because right now everyone makes the same decisions, you know, uh, the way tier ones have made. So they will also opt for a captain system and say, I have a work order management system. I mean, it, it works fine. But the point is, the the resources that tier one FM company has to make changes is, is, is obviously much larger than any than the tier two or an emerging player would happen would have. So they should always look at uh, a platform approach and say, I'm solving for operations and maintenance. I don't want my platform to book room meetings as well, right? Or to help my people find parking areas. That's not what I'm looking at. But I'm looking at everything that is required to be done across the asset life cycle from the operations and maintenance perspective should happen in a single platform and i think that's that's something that the emerging fm company should look at what's common in both of them that they need to have a system of record plus a system of decisions which would allow them to basically uh, have a feedback loop established every time some someone does something on an asset goes back to the repository learns and there's a there's a feedback loop which is established uh, right, so that's how I would say what, according to me, is probably the most preferred way of having it. Uh, and again, this is not FM specific. If you are looking at any industry which is which is heavily relying on data to make decisions, you would have this, this entire stack. Right? I mean, again, one one other call out. Like most of the people have, uh, you know, licenses of Tableau or Power BI, and and they say, okay, my data is connected to Power BI. I can look at dashboards. I'm sorry to break hearts, but that's not system of decisions. You still need qualified people to keep looking at that data and then to make decisions. There's no learning happening. The cost goes up as you scale and it invariably shuts down, right? You can't out, you know, that that model is not sustainable. So, uh, you know, dashboards aren't, you know, meant for everyone. One needs to understand that operations and maintenance does not involve the, uh, you know, it has involves people of varying skills uh, as far as data is concerned. And dashboards is for people who are right up the the rank from the perspective of making data uh, or looking at data with ease but you have majority of the workforce which can't do that and hence you know uh, do not think of power bi tableau or all those reports and saying that yes we have a decision support system you're probably only going to be uh, uh fooling yourselves for lack of better word so mainly the people who are going to be needing decision support are the ones who are working at the shop floor and who are actually carrying out the maintenance activities on the ground i mean they they need it the, it the most and one needs to understand that if, if they are not needing it the most then it's not going up the right it's it's a it's a it's not a top to bottom approach it's a bottom to top that's how it happens now let, let's take example of healthcare people who knows and or probably have heard me before we know that i keep going to healthcare when a patient is admitted into an hospital or who is the one which person has the most time or, or 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 like time spent with the with the or uh, touch with the patient. It's the nursing staff, right? The feedback from nursing staff on everything becomes absolutely cri critical for allowing doctors to make much better decisions on what medication to give, you know, how to treat, so on and so forth. So that's the same thing when you look at the assets. The the top engineers don't often spend time. I mean, that's not their role. They moved up the rank. They are now more managers, right? Versus engineers. I mean, some people still remain engineers at heart, but most of them become managers, uh, right? Now, so that's what I'm saying. That the the decision support needs to be first at the bottom of the spectrum, and that's only when it will move up the spectrum. And more often than not, people start from top, go to bottom, and that fails uh, somewhere along the journey. Right. Thanks, mate. I mean, uh, I've heard you like a number of times in, in the other calls, and I know that it's difficult to speak while you're speaking, but for the first time, I've got at least a chance to speak because that's how it, the podcast needs to run or the interview needs to run. Now, so that, thanks. You did a great job, and I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that we can continue to churn this, these, these out, uh, uh, you know, for, for our listeners. Thanks, mate. Thanks a lot. Same here.